Uh, so speaking of these other regional issues, uh, we will now turn to two of them, Iran and Syria, two countries where Trump's foreign policy is expected to mark a significant break from Obama's. And before I get started, I want to echo what my colleagues have said. We are looking not only at a reevaluation of American leadership, but of the analytical process, uh, how we look at politicians, how we perceive them to be making decisions. Uh, Trump doesn't follow the typical lines, and we have to keep that in mind when we're analyzing these issues. Looking first at Iran, uh, inauguration will occur almost one year since the Iran deal was implemented. And in that time, uh, American and Israeli security officials agree that the threat from Iran's nuclear program has been decreased. Uh, Iran has fewer nuclear materials, and the international community has a better ability to inspect facilities in Iran and to understand what's happening. Uh, this is important not because of trust, but because if there is a violation, if Iran does still work towards a weapons program, it means that the international community would find out about it earlier than before the Iran deal was signed. Um, the deal is not perfect, but it's largely regarded as better than what existed previously. And you see this not only in security assessments, but also in criticism of the deal, which has shifted from a nuclear focus to now focusing on what was not included in the deal. Uh, ballistic missile tests, terrorist financing, Iran's uh, activities in Syria, the US and Iran continue to clash on a lot of issues. And we see that the uh, nuclear crisis has now been turned down a notch and these other issues are coming more into focus. Uh, in Obama's last month, what can he do? The Iran deal has been one of his major foreign policy achievements and it's something that he would like very much to continue. Uh, so there are three things that he could do. First, the national security team can make a case to the incoming administration that this is a good deal, that it's in America's security interests, and that it's better than throwing away the deal. Uh, secondly, Obama could take some sort of limited steps to institutionalize the communications framework that has developed after the deal. Uh, the communications between Kerry and Zarif have enabled the US and Iran to more quickly, quickly resolve issues related to both the nuclear deal and other things that come up. Uh, Kerry will be leaving and Iran has their own elections in May, so it's important for anyone looking towards um, the future of this deal to analyze how, how communication will go in the next few years. Uh, the third thing that President Obama could do during his last month is to strengthen Iran's commitment to the deal by reissuing uh, business guidelines to facilitate uh, new growth in Iran. Um, the Iranians see the relief of sanctions as largely not helping their economy as much as they thought it would. Um, they blame the US for that in many public statements. And issuing business clarifications to help uh, increase those ties could help strengthen Iran's commitment. When we look at the deal's future, we have two questions. Uh, Trump, during the campaign, said that he was going to rip up the deal and it would, have, would be one of his top priorities. The first question is, can he do that? Can he just leave? And the second question is, will he? Um, before I start, it's hard to analyze, will he? Uh, I think that we need to consider taking him at his word, uh, even if there's evidence to the contrary. Um, he is very unpredictable, but there's this tendency to not take him at his word that I think is problematic, uh, to sort of rationalize some things that aren't rational or to try to fit it into our existing analytical framework when he's really not coming from that place. Um, so on the first point, can Trump tear up the deal? Yes, he can. It's not a formal treaty, and either side can decide that it wants to leave. This is one of the reasons why the US just renewed the Iran Sanctions Act, so that if Iran were to make that calculation and leave, there would be some uh, punitive action that the US could take. There are a few protections in place. The agreement isn't just between the US and Iran. It includes the P5 plus one uh, and separate agreements with Iran and the International Atomic Energy Agency related to inspections and other issues. So there is a uh, protection. If Trump were to say that the US is walking away from this deal, uh, the European countries could refuse to follow suit. General Mattis said something similar. Uh, that absent a clear and present violation, it's very difficult for the US to justify uh, going back on this deal, and that unilateral sanctions issued by the US, while they're powerful, they don't compare to the coordinated regime that was in place before. So this is one catch, um, and if it looks like Trump will walk away, 
uh, I imagine that European diplomats will be making that case privately. The second question is, uh, will he? As we said, Trump is unpredictable. I'm not comfortable saying what he will or will not do, but there's a very strong case uh, to say that the deal is working. Um, in addition, Trump uh, has a lot of issues to deal with now, and his base is primarily concerned with domestic issues. Uh, if they want to repeal anything, it's first health care. Um, it's looking at the immigration framework. This is not something that Trump's base is pushing him to address right now. So absent a major provocation from Iran, it's difficult to make the case that it would be in Trump's own interest to focus first on Iran. Um, we also said earlier, uh, Trump is not an ideal, or maybe he believes in nothing, speaking a little bit less diplomatically. Um, and he often changes positions, and we see this already. During his, one of his meetings with Mattis, it took him one hour to walk back his position on uh, torture. So he is very open to his advisors, um, whoever those people may be in the end. And he's already walked back his position on the Iran deal from first saying, we are going to throw it away, to saying, we are going to negotiate a better deal. Uh, in order to do that, he needs to believe that there is a prospect of a better deal. Uh, we see now businesses also making the case. Uh, this week, Boeing <coughs> announced the uh, $16 billion deal to deliver 80 planes to Iran. It's scheduled for completion in, I think, 2018. And the Boeing executives who made this uh, announcement focused on how it helps job creation in the US and that this deal will create thousands of new jobs in the US. That's speaking Trump's language, that's speaking to his concerns, and that's a way that we see even the private sector uh, acting. When we look at other issues, uh, it's clear that Trump will want to take a tougher line on Iran. And when he says he wants to negotiate a better deal, what is he mean? On the nuclear issue, he probably wants a more decisive victory over Iran. I'm not sure if that's uh, something that he can reasonably expect. Um, but potentially, he wants to take a harder line on Iran's violations of ballistic missile regulations and um, the other actions of IRGC officials. We keep in mind the US still has a host of sanctions on Iran. Um, so going forward, I think sequencing will be very important for Trump. There is room for him to take a harder line on Iran, to say, I want to address terrorist financing um, in a more uh, high-profile, comprehensive way. I want to address uh, ballistic missile tests. But he should be very conscious of Iran's upcoming May elections. Um, President Rouhani is eligible for a second term in office, and he's running against hardliners who see no point in engagement with the West and certainly would not be open to renegotiating a better deal for the US. Uh, Rouhani campaigned on a platform of moderation and promised to resolve the nuclear crisis. Uh, this deal is the centerpiece of his achievements. And we saw earlier this year in Iran's parliamentary elections, the reformists did well. And this is widely considered to be a reflection of positive Iranian attitudes towards Rouhani's platform of engagement. Uh, I think it's important when we talk about Rouhani, sometimes people say, why do we call him a moderate? He's a cleric, he's not what we think of as a moderate. Um, but it's important to look at who we're comparing him to and what the previous Iranian regime was like. The weaknesses of Rouhani are economics. He has faced a lot of criticism in Iran for not delivering the economic benefits of sanctions relief, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, a lot of big European banks are not engaged with Iran, even though now they can. Uh, for a mix of business reasons, political reasons, and sometimes just not knowing like how to navigate this web of uh, government restriction. That's why I said earlier that President Obama could provide uh, additional guidance. So basically, the worst case scenario we could see for the Iran nuclear issue is for Trump to either immediately walk away from the deal or to antagonize Iran and Rouhani in this crucial pre-election period. Uh, the hardliners will use all of that in the campaign, and we could end up with uh, a Trump administration and a new hardline Iranian regime that has no interest in engagement or in discussion. Um, this is not to say things right now are great, but it's to say that there, there have been uh, achievements and they are now, they're now hanging in the balance. So I would hope that Trump's advisors caution him to be aware of the sequencing and to understand the realities of Iran's presidential elections. Turning now a little bit to Syria, which Gershon talked about earlier. 
Um, like he said, it, it's very hard to be optimistic. The siege on Syria continues. Uh, the U.S. Uh, on Aleppo, I'm sorry. The U.S. and Russia tried for, uh, to fight a ceasefire a few days ago, and Russia said that no, we will not agree to an immediate ceasefire. Uh, it would have to wait a few days, in effect, until Aleppo fell. Um, you don't have a few days when the regime is closing in on the city. Um, there have been reports since last night that Russia and Turkey negotiated a temporary ceasefire to get out uh, potentially militants, potentially everyone. Um, but then today there were additional results of shelling. Um, so we've seen this US-led negotiations process, uh, which hasn't succeeded. Um, the fall of Aleppo is going to be a huge win for Assad and for Russia, but it's not the end of the war. And another recent event is the reconquest of Palmyra by the Islamic State. And this indicates that Iran, and Russia, and other actors are providing the regime enough support so that they're in a strong enough position to retake territory, but holding the territory is another question. And that's something that's very uh, important to consider. Uh, even though Russia has been strongly backing Assad, they do still want to resolve the conflict relatively quickly, and they're very conscious of avoiding another Afghanistan. Russia is now exploiting the transition time between the elections and between the time when Trump's administration settles in to be increasingly aggressive in Syria. They know that the US has a limited capacity to respond in this period of time, and this is when they can increase their aggression and get themselves and Assad to what they see as the strongest position possible. Uh, at this point, the Obama administration has lost most of its leverage. The Russians and the Syrians have every incentive to wait for Trump. Trump largely accepts Russia's rhetoric of focusing on terrorists and seems likely to accept Russia's definition for who is a terrorist. He has spoken out against arming the moderate opposition numerous times. The US is still pushing for a political process, but there's little indication that meaningful progress will be made in the near term. Uh, the idea of a unified Syrian state right now seems very distant. It's very hard to talk about. And as we even imagine that one day there will be a political process uh, that involves elections, when it happens, only Syrians in the country will be able to vote. So we see mounting casualties every day, refugees leaving. Uh, the more time that goes by at this point, the better for Assad. Trump thus far has a very unclear Syria policy and has displayed a lot of deference to Russia. He shows an inclination towards disengagement, as we spoke earlier, about his willingness to invest political capital in the region. This is another area where it's not clear if he will make that calculation. He has a strong disinclination towards the responsibility to protect or the humanitarian elements of the conflict that the Obama administration has addressed or tried to address. And he's likely to focus on fighting the Islamic State to the exclusion of virtually anything else. Um, this is problematic because there is a window for increased US engagement and an increased US role um, due to the regime's inability to rehold uh, conquered territory. So there is a window, but we'll see if he takes it. Uh, when analysts say, what will Trump do in Syria? They tend to say, okay, one option is he'll follow Russia's lead and that's it. Another option is he'll decide to arm the moderate opposition. Uh, this seems completely out. He says, we don't know who these people are. He might think they are all terrorists, and he opposes this. Um, the idea of a limited no-fly zone is possible, but it's hard to perceive that Trump would do that alone without the support of Russia. Um, the third thing he could potentially do is look towards deeper sanctions, which could potentially bring uh, Assad and the Russians to the negotiating table slightly earlier, but will not reshape the fundamental distribution of power uh, or advance negotiations in a significant way. As it stands, <coughs> Russia's policy is to first make the point that there is some time pressure. This can't go on forever. Um, the more crisis we see, the more Syria deteriorates, the less likely it seems that we'll ever get back towards a unified Syrian state, which Russia does have an interest in. Russia doesn't to be entrenched in different provinces in Syria forever. Um, the US can also make the case that Assad needs to go relatively soon for this whole of Syria solution to be viable. Uh, he's simply killed too many people to have any legitimacy to stand at the head of a whole of Syria situation uh, for anything more than a very temporary period. Um, 
there's little indication that Trump will follow the Obama uh, administration's lead on anything related to Syria, or will feel tied to UN Security Council Resolution 2254, including its emphasis on the humanitarian aspects. Um, this is an area where we see US Middle East policy um, has not succeeded, despite a lot of efforts, despite a lot of meetings in Europe, the war rages on, and there, it, it's hard to imagine a successful resolution of Syria, and it's hard to imagine Trump playing a constructive role in that, especially as he pivots more towards Russia. Uh, so I think I will stop there, it's gotten a bit long, and save the rest for questions. Thank you.